So welcome to our latest edition of the Virtual Bridge Sessions. And I'm sorry to say you'll be hearing from me today. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll be talking about hybrid delivery, which is, I have to admit, a new thing for me. The, the idea of teaching in a class with, with physical students, but at the same time delivering to a remote cohort in the same class. That, honestly, that just fills me with a bit of dread. Um, the closest that I've come to that is perhaps where I've been in a lot of meetings where I've had remote participants join through video conferencing. Now, I'm, I'm gonna hold my hand up and apologize to all those people that have joined any meeting that I facilitated, that they often got the raw deal. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 it was it was a tough break for them because they were the poor cousins in any meeting. Um, I I can't tell you the number of times I just remembered uh, to ask. Oh oh, John, and what what do you think about about that point that was mentioned a few minutes ago? And I I think creating that sense of equity in a meeting experience is challenging enough. It can be done. But it is definitely challenging. But transferring that into an educational context is, is well, perilous, to say the least. So I've been doing a bit of reading. <clears throat> Not much. I, I, I look for all of the, <laughs> the, the real guidance from people in this room. Um, but around what is hybrid learning and, and the other terms that go along with it, high flex, concurrent, Simulcast, these are all terms that are new to me, but ones that I'll share with you. So let me share my screen. Okay, so <clears throat> hybrid delivery, the best of both worlds, but quite commonly the worst of both too. Now in this, um, I suppose you have to ask well, why hybrid? And, and the answer is pretty obvious. It's probably not by choice in many cases, and it's simply a reaction to the current situation with COVID. Um, hybrid has been adopted by some institutions as a standard way of teaching, especially in higher education, where they're focusing on flexible delivery, giving students the choice of whether to attend in person or online. Now, hybrid might not be around for such a long time, but it's true that organizations are investing in hybrid delivery in terms of the kit that they set out with rooms. So at least for the short term, especially with students potentially self-isolating, it may be with us for some time. When you're looking at hybrid, you have to make some kind of assumptions to start out with. And I'm not sure that all of these hold true necessarily. So the, the assumptions that I'm making here and generally in the literature is that the people who are coming into your class remotely you can see them, they're, they're visible. And in an ideal sense, they're also visible to the, the students who are in the classroom, because you have to create that sense that everyone's in it together and, and you lose enough social capital by people not being present. Now, as well as being visible, you also assume that they're able to interact in some way. They're not trapped in a lecture room at some other place and just watching on screen with no ability to communicate or chat. So there is the ability to participate with the lecturer and potentially with the other students in the class. And, and obviously, um, it would be nice to think that the assumption is there will be digital devices in the classroom itself. And this is by no means guaranteed. But in order to facilitate collaboration and interaction, you kind of need the people who are coming in remotely. Obviously, they're on their laptops or mobile devices, but the people in the classroom as well also to have access to some kind of um, device that allows them to interact across the board. So what's what, what are the key messages that come out when you're designing for hybrid delivery? I, I think probably for almost everyone that I'd, I'd read, they said a key aspect of it, which is very similar to remote teaching, is consistency. Consistency, consistency in the approach of how you, you deliver these lessons. It's a hard enough with people using kit to access with a new medium, with the fact that your, your class is already split. So keeping things consistent, coming up with a plan for your lessons 
and sticking to that basic model is really, really important. It allows people to have a level of expectation when they're coming into the class. They know what's coming, they know the format, and in a sense, they're more prepared and able to deal with anything that might transpire that's <laughs> not going to plan. So having consistency in delivery is really, really important. If, depending on your lesson, that you can't, you can't create the same kind of lesson plan for every th time that you teach, I, th I think it's important to try and aim for some level of consistency. And at a minimum, perhaps, is at the beginning and at the end of a lesson. So one of the things that people wrote about was the idea that the remote students often felt disconnected with the whole process. They, they didn't feel part of it. And to limit that, a lot of teachers and lecturers said that when people join a class for the first time in the morning, not the first time, every time they come to class, it's good to set a precedent where you connect with every individual in the room. Like just call them out by name. Hey, Jason, how are you doing? Are you having a good day? <laughs> Walter, how, how are you? Even that simple social chat, making people feel present is really, really important in creating that connection. And even if that takes five minutes to go around the room, it's time well spent. Now, you can also do the kind of regular startup tasks. Um, maybe you want to review the, the content in the previous lesson. Maybe you want to run through a quick quiz. A lot of literature says that quizzing, if you're using kind of those interactive polling tools or online quiz formats, are a good way just to start things off. Everyone's involved. It's, it's an equitable experience. Um, and it's, it's a good way of just triggering, obviously, some of the, the work that had come before. Uh, one other key aspect is to set out the plan for your lesson. Now, if you can't have a consistent lesson every time, at least tell people at the beginning of the class, this is what we're going to do. Now, you'll be doing that anyway, but to make it very visible to the remote and the face-to-face uh, -face students, put up a plan and say, this is what we're going to cover today. Um, although it might seem slightly counterintuitive and, and, and maybe obvious for some, just seeing it up on the screen and knowing what's coming is is just it puts people in a much safer frame of mind they just they know what's going on they're not going to get any surprises and at the end just close in the same way just review how it's gone it's good to check in with your students and just say how did things go with you um pick out individuals and just say you, you know I, I wouldn't necessarily labor the fact i wouldn't ask people you know what did you learn what do you want to ask questions about you know what did you feel could have gone better it doesn't have to be a <laughs> a whole thing but at least check in to see how people are feeling um it's it's not good to underestimate how much mindfulness or mental health is important at this point and 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 distance can also exacerbate those feelings so taking that into account is important so introduce consistency okay so Vanderbilt University had come out with a series of discussions around how do you design for that hybrid environment? What works and what doesn't? Now, in that sense, um, they picked out a few elements. Um, so for example, they talked about class discussion, which was a, a significant part of their delivery, typically in a remote situation. But they, they recognized that class discussion, whole class discussion is really hard in a hybrid setting, um, primarily to do th with things like having a mic that actually covers the entire classroom or teaching space. Like, can you hear people who offer individual opinions and comments or questions? The, the practicalities of it means that it, it, it's perhaps something that you shouldn't rely on. And ideally you should move towards smaller groups uh, and other techniques such as the use of back channels. So a back channel is basically a communication method by which you can, everyone can participate and talk while the teacher is talking. Um, <laughs> I don't know why that would bug me. It's just my need for attention, I suspect. But <laughs> creating a back channel, so that could be through any chat system that your, your VLE or your, or your organization hosts, um, or a separate channel if, if you want to set something up independently. But something that allows 
everyone in the class and remotely to chat with each other, um, to hold discussions, to ask questions. That back channel becomes, um, it glues the class together. But some important aspects that they pointed out were try to, if you create a back channel, so a text chat method for everyone to access, try to enforce the use of it through certain um, precedents. So for example, if you want people in the class to ask you a question, don't, don't rely on people holding up their hand. I mean, you can if you want, but ideally, if you use a back channel, say like if you want to ask me a question or if you want to raise a point as I'm speaking, put it into the channel. Because that means that the people who are remote and the people in the class have kind of equality in the way that they ask a question. Otherwise, it's the person in the class who holds up their hand or, or catches the, the attention of the, the lecturer is going to have an advantage over the remote sort of class attendance. So in some ways, if you can, if you can create that as the primary form of contact in certain contexts, it, it just makes for a more equitable experience. Fishbowl was also mentioned, I have to say, it's not something I was familiar with. Um, a fishbowl technique is where you separate the class into essentially two groups. One group um, discusses the topic on um, that's being put forward and the, the rest of the class observes that discussion, takes notes, and when you interrogate afterwards, you get the observers to comment on the discussion that's just been had and then you you swap roles now i i i think that's a reasonable thing to do in class and depending on the number of people you have joining remotely possibly that's that's something you could design in into your lessons um i, I think it really depends on the the mix the numbers involved here um, it, it seems interesting though, and it's, it's worth reading up on Vanderbilt's sort of commentary around that. Polling seems like a good choice if you have voting systems, if you have some simple way to break up a lesson, just to check understanding, to get opinions. I think it's a good opportunity for just simple quizzing. Almost all the research suggests that breaking up any kind of lesson, but especially in a hybrid context, that quizzing engages everyone. It, I, again, it puts everyone on an even field. It's, it's just a good way to stimulate, understand that everyone's following what you're saying, and get everyone involved. So polling reasonably frequently in a one hour class, you might have three episodes. That's, that's a good rule of thumb, including platformative assessment polling seems like a good idea. Hybrid pair work is another suggested approach. And this is whereby if you want to ensure that someone remotely really is connecting, pair them up with somebody in the class who has a device and make sure that they're able to, to chat with each other, uh, communicate. Um, even when you're setting up breakout rooms, um, as long as someone remotely feels that they're connected with people within the class, it adds to the experience. Also, it's, it's the idea of buddying up is, is quite nice. Um, they do suggest rotating that, not necessarily sticking friends with friends, but you know, whatever works, it seems like a good idea. Of course, um, flipped lessons seem to be uh, a useful approach. So creating some kind of asynchronous plan into your delivery, um, allowing people to access the content before they come in for the, the kind of live session with you so that they're, they're all prepared. They've all seen the material. I say all prepared. I realize that getting people to actually do the stuff before they come to classes is, is a bit of a pipe dream in most cases it takes a lot of time unless you start out with a flipped approach with your lessons from day one and continue it forward i guarantee it it it, it will be a struggle um i learned that through bitter experience um the last one is i've included it because vanderbilt talks about it but i'm not wholly convinced flip flop which just sounds like an excellent beach experience. But flip-flop is this idea of creating stations. This is very common in, in kind of primary settings. Um, you stations of work and you split the class into smaller groups and get them to go through different stations of work. Now flip-flop specifically talks about basically an online activity and an offline activity. So you get a group to do an 
offline tasks. So this is work independently or as a group through some set of activities that you've set up, whatever that be, go watch a video, go read this piece of text, come up with ideas around this thought. And then there's a, an online aspect where you're interacting with a smaller group to talk them through or work them through some kind of problem or, or see the results of some problem that they've attempted. And this is to increase the amount of time that you have speaking with individuals or smaller groups, which is, is clearly an issue with this kind of hybrid delivery. Anyway, it's worth a read. I, I, I would give it a go. Um, there's a guy called uh, Larry Ferlazzo. Ferlazzo. See, I've never had to say his name out loud. I've just read it and looked. That was a really cool name. Um, but until now, I haven't had to ever pronounce it. Um, <clears throat> clearly, I should practice these things. Now, he, uh, Larry's like a really interesting guy. He writes on his own blog um, and he posts on, on, on various kind of American sites. And he he did this thing for Ed Week recently where it was like a, a seven, <laughs> I think he started out as a, a two-part post on hybrid learning, but it became a seven-part post. It's kind of like when I start talking for 10 minutes and end up talking for an hour. Um, and he, he drew in all these people and asked them, well, how, how did you experience hybrid learning and what, what sort of stood out for you as good things? So, so, so a lot of the points that we mentioned previously were covered, um, but some of the key things that stood out in that, uh, and it's worth looking through his posts, is have a backup plan. This just seems sensible. Um, make sure that your, your remote students are coming in some of them might lose connection. Some of them might, you know, drop out for whatever reason. So as long as all the content in the class is made available online too, so they can access it either um, afterwards. And it's the same for people who miss things. I mean, it's it's pretty much common sense. Um, but creating sort of the same content so it's accessible, even if people drop out, so that they don't miss out entirely, which just seems like good advice in general. Um, build in these offline activities within the lesson. So this is like talking about the flip-flop thing, but also setting time within a lesson to create asynchronous tasks, like split up, stop for 20 minutes and get them to go away and do something, write up something, read something, research something, watch something, whatever, and use that time to check in with your remote students because your remote students are, are not getting the best part of this deal. So it's good to try and find the time within the lesson just to check in to make sure, how are you doing? Are you following along? Are you struggling with anything? And, and just creating your lesson plan so that it allows you the time to check in with people is, is a good idea. Keeping the plan simple is important. It's pretty, there's a fair cognitive overload when the fact that you have to deal with the medium that you're connecting with, you might have to be doing digital tasks. And these are things that you're not necessarily familiar with. So just keeping things simple is, <laughs> is probably a good idea, especially as the majority of people say, you probably won't get through as much as if you were teaching wholly online or wholly in class. You, you should start off the expectation that you may get less done than you intended to. So part of keeping the lesson plan simple helps with meeting and progressing those lessons. Um, right, so uh, what about the space itself? So I'm, I'm going to an example here that's from Belgium, who, which was mentioned by, by Duncan. Um, who delivered a previous session on creating a virtual hybrid space teaching space for City of Glasgow College. And <laughs> basically this goes one step further. This is literally, if you have the king of all budgets and you can just buy anything you want, this is the way to go, <laughs> apparently. So this, this is interesting. Um, so this university has a high flex approach to its, its teaching. Um, it has nine campuses, I think, possibly 12. I don't know. Um, and as a student, you're allowed to come physically to the class or join remotely to any of the classes that you want. Um, it's entirely flexible. So this hybrid flexible delivery notion, um, <laughs> it's really interesting, but they, they set up and designed a room to make this the optimal experience for all involved. So one of the key things that Duncan mentioned in his previous session is having monitors placed in such a way that you can see the students in the classroom as if you were just talking to a normal class. And so in this case, you can see there's a bank of monitors at the back here, um, which basically shows you all, all of the students. In fact, there's another picture they have here, which this shows a full class. And as a teacher, in, in some of this feedback, the teacher says, this is pretty much 
the same as teaching to a normal class. I can see all the names. <laughs> I can see the faces. They're all roughly of an, uh, the size of, as if you were in person. So teaching becomes quite a thing. Now, the interesting aspect of it is that, again, limitless budget. Um, when you look at how the remote student perceives the classroom, so this is a screenshot of, of how they see it. They see the central, the central picture that you see there is of, of the whatever, the PowerPoint, the presentation that the lecturer is delivering. But on the left-hand side, they have a series of up to five cameras in the room where they can choose to see um, a different perspective of the room. They can see the lecturer, they can see the, the classmates, they can see other parts. So it gives them the kind of less restricted view of being in the class. And they said that this is a really important part of feeling as, as if you're engaged with lesson, that as if you're almost there. Obviously, you see the other remote students in the bottom there. And on the right hand side, they have this chat area, this idea of a back channel where people can communicate. Um, I get again, you know, if you had an infinite budget, <laughs> I'd love to teach in that space. That that looks awesome to me. Oh, but you know, <clears throat> such are the things that dreams are made of. Right. So, um, but for everyone else, <laughs> back to reality. Uh, what are the what's the basic things you really need for hybrid delivery? Um, from what I see. So in an ideal world, you want uh, a very sophisticated mic array system that allows you to pick up everything in the classroom so you can have that kind of classroom discussion and you can pick up questions. Now, the reality is probably at a minimum, what you want is to have that a, per, a, a personal wireless mic, a mic that attaches to you, that connects to your your laptop or your desktop, that just allows you to, to walk around a bit. Um, honestly, that's just a cost. And whether that's a reality for people, I'm, I'm not sure. But even if you had a mic that you could position somewhere that picks up and gives you a bit of room to walk around a bit of the room, that's so important for face-to-face -face teaching for me. I, I literally can't keep still. Like, it's a struggle to, for me to just sit here and talk to you. I literally just want to wander around the room while I'm talking. Um, I miss that, but it adds something to the whole teaching experience. Um, camera. Um, okay, so... In the, in the ideal world, you'd have a tracking camera that followed you around. I, I, I played around with these swivel devices where you wore a lanyard with a mic and you could walk around and the camera followed you. Just what? Fun. It was like living in the future. Honestly, it felt like the Jetsons. Um, but you, you want a camera that you can, you can move. So even if it's a laptop that you're working from with a camera attached, that you can move the laptop so you can position it in the best place so that your students can see what's going on and you teaching on the whiteboard, even if it's like a picture in picture thing, being able to see you teach and see the class, those are really important things. There's a really interesting post where one guy describes setting up a, a laptop where he moves into two positions using what, what's a lazy Susan, you know, that thing that he grabbed from his dining room. Um, he sticks on there and he marks two spots in his classroom where he knows the camera is best place to see him, some of the classroom and, and the board. And it, it swivels basically the laptop around into these two positions so that his students get the best possible view of him in the classroom. Um, small ideas like that really work. Even if you have a trolley um, with a laptop on top of it so you can move it around or a desktop, that, you know, it's something. Um, and, and probably the other thing is to have a second laptop. Uh, not laptop, a second screen, so that potentially you can always see your online students all the time. Um, that's that's just important. Obviously, when you're sharing your screen on a, set, a single device, you, you lose sight of everyone in the room, but you can still see the people in the room. So again, for equity, if you've got a second screen, you might log in um, with a second device, uh, log in as a regular Zoom or Teams client, and you can just see everyone in the room. That that's That's really important, I think. Um, right, I'm going to push ahead because time will definitely run out because I'll wrap it on. So I have so many slides left. I have so many slides. What's a boy to do? Right. So um, <clears throat> delivery in terms of delivery, right? Some this guy Eric Hudson. So he writes a lot for um, GOA Global Online Academy. I think you know most of it's pretty good. So he put out a question um, out on Twitter and he got a bunch of responses and he created these 16 basic tips for hybrid learning, which most of which are fine. Um, I'll share the link. You can follow it, read up, 
yourself. The key things I think that he said for me is, again, he emphasized connecting with the students via back channels, how well that worked, sharing the plan of your lesson, um, and making the additional time for remote students. All of those things were, were good. Some of the other comments that came in, some of the Twitter chat that I, I read afterwards and associated comments and questions that were raised from his post is, um, <laughs> they said it's, it's really useful that when people ask you questions in a room that isn't fully mic'd, repeat the questions and the comments that students make so your remote learners can hear it. Uh, that, that can be an issue. Um, also, if you're creating like the small groups for discussion, um, it's good to have a device or devices in the room for your face-to-face -face students so that you can create force everyone to go into breakout rooms for discussions, like, like online breakout rooms, so that you can get your online students mixing with your face-to-face -face students and give them a task to do for 10 minutes so they can talk to each other, get used to that method. The, the whole thing about normalizing this whole experience is important from the get-go. Like, don't, even to the extent of don't expect to deliver your curriculum and your lessons in the first few lessons, get people used to this idea of interacting and working with people at a distance and in the classroom. Um, I'm looking at my own time. I'm going to run out of time. So um, work mode. This is a this is an awesome one that I like from Mike Flynn. Um, he, he said that people, and this is good for remote teaching as well, people get tired of being on a camera all of the time. It's just painful. Well, not me, because I thrive the attention and I love the sound of my own voice, but like people get sick of being on a camera all the time. So he created this idea of work modes. So for offline students uh, or, or online students, both really, he said, like, set them a task. So maths, for example, say you have a maths task, right? So you have to fill out this worksheet, attempt these tasks, some kind of written work, point the camera at your work, so that all you can see is basically your hand and, and, and the paper that you're working with. You know, that's and that as a teacher, that's all I need to see. I mean, I just need to see that you're doing the work and see how you're getting along. I can walk around a physical room, even with social distancing, and see that people are doing work. Get that work mode idea and give people a break from being on camera all the time. Also for the people who just don't like sharing their faces, you know, you could suggest to them, right, this is the work mode, this is a task to do it, switch on your cameras and point it at the piece of paper or whatever it is you're doing to, to do the work. And I think people might feel more relaxed about using their camera if they think that they're not physically going to be displayed on it. it it's an idea, definitely worth doing. Um, Right, I'm, I'm just going to skip through to the end because it's, it's definitely getting to my 30 minutes. Students, um, I would say that from the research, it says that overall remote students probably have a less of an ideal experience than those face to face. Um, there's all those issues around potentially they're dealing with the medium itself, online interacting, and it's a bit of a, a, an overload for them. Um, they definitely need time to adjust, spend the first few weeks just getting people comfortable, establish consistent delivery lesson plans, you know, give them a sense of expectation when they join these sessions. Um, ultimately, though, given the choice, they, they, may, they may balance some of that negative stuff that they're experiencing, just knowing that obviously you're explaining that this is a way to get you into the lesson and to continue your learning. You know, I, you're doing it for them. To, to accommodate the situation that we all find ourselves in. And I think to a certain extent, you know, they'll, they'll let you away with stuff. They'll understand. And it's just about talking and making that connection. In terms of the lecturers, probably the same thing. I, I would say, um, oh, in that Belgian university, like when they set up that room, again, limitless budget, they had a separate person who worked all the technology. The lecturer just stood in the class and did his thing and, you know, or her thing, <clears throat> taught the lesson, went through the slides, did the activities. There was a separate member of staff who literally controlled the back channel, uh, typed in text, set up the polls, fired off the quizzes. The lecturer didn't have to do any of that. Um, they did suggest that after a few weeks, it was a question of getting the lecturer comfortable with that technology and being able to manage some of that process um, themselves. Uh, and, and frequently they do they did take over and become independent, but it took time. Um, so I wouldn't, oh, I, I imagine hybrid teaching. No, I, I, I'd, I'd like to give it a go, to be honest. 
but I could see it being challenging. So it, it definitely, all of the literature says it involves more time, definite more time for design, more it's new to most people. It's going to take you time to come up with a good lesson. Um, also remote teacher, the remote teaching, the remote learners, they have less time for you. So almost in every case, there's a sense of you having to reach out to the rules, remote learners to check in to see if they're okay. And that just adds to your day. Um, there's a definite benefit for not going in cold and just doing it yourself for the first time. If at all possible, watch examples of it being done online, go or, or, or even within your own institution, see if you can join in as a remote learner just to see what it's like and just get a feel for some of the, the challenges you might face. Okay, um, oh, look at that, I can jump slides here and my time is more than up. Thanks for listening. Um, I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining this session. We're gonna stay here for a bit of a discussion, but if you're joining us via YouTube, um, you can now just go on to the more exciting video. But <laughs> hopefully you'll be able to join us for a live session at some point. Um, and, and you know, and there, there are lots of interesting topics coming up, but until then, um, please stay safe and stay well. Thank you.